Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nityanamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravadi Pacharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschata Desha Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you so kindly for making this arrangement and the kind words of introduction. The topic is spiritualism in modern life. To understand <clears throat> what this is, first we should understand what spiritualism means, what is spiritual life. There are many different ideas about what spiritual life is. Mostly it's rather vague and undefined. There's a widespread idea that spiritual life is whatever you make of it, whatever you consider it to be. But actually, spiritual life must begin with understanding what is spirit. Spiritual life is by definition distinguished from material life. And what is spirit? Many people may give different opinions, but the definition of what is spirit and what is spirit spiritual life is given in Bhagavad Gita. I have in front of me Bhagavad Gita as it is. In which it's well known Arjun didn't want to fight and Krishna explained to him that Najayate Mriyate Va Kada Chinayam Bhutva Bhavita Vanabuya Ajo Nityam Shashvato Yam Kurano Nahanyate Hanyamane Shariare That the body may be killed, but the soul never comes into being nor is ever killed. The soul is eternal. Several synonyms are given by Krishna. The soul is unborn, eternal, everlasting, ancient. Even if the body is killed, the soul is never killed. And there are further descriptions in Bhagavad Gita. Avinashi to Tadviti, Yena Sarva Midam Tatam. Vinashi, Abhya Yas Yasya. That although the body is clearly destructible, the soul is not. I suggest if we want to listen to what's being said, that photography be less and listening be more, because it's a distraction. Yerasa Bhadme Ophoto Kitsi. Avinani, 
सोचो वाला पंजाब में खाली पंजाबी भाषा चलते हैं कोई हिंदी नहीं मानी नहीं मानी लेकिन मुझे पंजाबी नहीं जानता माफ कैसे All right, you can point it at this. You can point it at this body. Then I can't see your bodies, but you're all souls. Krishna teaches in Bhagavad Gita that the body is temporary and the soul is eternal. It's a simple principle. It's not very difficult to understand. Several examples Lord Krishna gives. देहिनो स्मिन्य था देहे कुमार योगनं जरा तथा देहां जरा प्राप्ति धीरस तत्र नमोहिति लॉर्ड कृष्ण गिव्स द एग्जांपल दैट वी सी यंग चिल्ड्रन एंड द बॉडी चेंजेस फ्रॉम दैट ऑफ अ यंग चाइल्ड टू दैट ऑफ अ यंग एडल्ट फ्रॉम फ्रॉम दैट ऑफ अ यंग एडल्ट टू एन ओल्ड एडल्ट and death is just another change in the cycle of the body but death doesn't mean the death of the soul it simply means that the soul goes to another body so one who is dhira one who understands these points is not disturbed tasamsi jnani yathavi haya navani grahnati narokarani तथा शरीरानि विहाय जनानि अन्यानि संयाति नवानि देहि अनदर एग्जांपल कृष्ण गिव्स इज दैट जस्ट लाइक क्लॉथ क्लोथिंग कवर्स द बॉडी व्हेन द क्लोथिंग इज वॉर्न आउट इट इज डिस्कार्डेड एंड न्यू क्लॉथ इज एक्सेप्टेड सो सिमिलरली द बॉडी इज अ कवरिंग फॉर द सोल and when the body is worn out the soul takes another body how does that happen yang yang bhati smaran bhavam cha cham te kalevaram tam tam e vaiti kontaya sada tat bhav bhavita that according to the consciousness at the time of death whatever we're thinking of at the time of death according to that we get a new body so spiritual life what is the meaning of spiritual life it means first of all to understand that the body is temporary and the soul is eternal therefore spiritual life is more important than material life because whatever we do in relation to the body is temporary whether we are prime minister of the country the richest man in the country the fastest runner in the country the best batsman in the country whatever it may be it's all temporary and therefore ultimately meaningless spiritual life is more important but what does spiritual life mean it means that which is in relationship to spirit so then well what does spirit do we know in material life what we do we eat we sleep there's mating man woman relationship there's fearing and defending and fighting so many activities in human society but what what does spiritual life actually mean well then that again we get the clue from bhagavad gita ममाय वांश जीव लोके जीव भूत सनातन दि जीव और सोल इज पार्ट ऑफ कृष्ण सो द स्पिरिचुअल लाइफ मींस इन रिलेशनशिप विद कृष्ण नाउ देयर आर डिफरेंट रिलीजियस प्रोसेसेस विद इन द वर्ल्ड एंड they speak of god bhagavan jehovah allah krishna is the personal name of god as spiritual living beings we are all eternally 
part and parcel of Krishna. They're all eternally related with Krishna. That's his personal name. If at all we are to accept there is God, I presume that you've come here to join this discussion on spiritualism in modern life. Well, spiritualism presupposes if we accept there is spiritualism, and if you don't think there is spiritualism, I presume you wouldn't have come here anyway. So, that we accept that there is God. Then, God means the supreme controller, the supremely powerful, the supremely kind. That means ultimately the supreme person. So, who is he? What does he do? What is his name? He has many names. Some people say that, well, God has no name. No material name, not, not like our name. Our name can be changed. We get different names according to different bodies. But God never dies, so his name is eternal. And his qualities are eternal. So he has unlimited names, as he has unlimited qualities. But his most well-known name, or the most definitive name of God, is Krishna. Krishna means all-attractive. Generally, we think of God as all-powerful. That's true, but that's not everything about him. It's not simply that he's all-powerful. He's also, he owns everything. He's all-opulent. Aishvaryasya, Samagrasya, Viryasya. In the definition of the term Bhagavan, first of all it's stated that he owns everything and he is all powerful. Yashasa, he is all famous. Viryasya, Yashasa, Shriyaha. God is also all beautiful. He is not simply some vague idea or some light. But he is Satyam, Shiva, and what's next? Sundaram. So he's most beautiful. All beauty. Shriha, Gyan. He's all knowledgeable. He knows everything. Gyana, Vairagya. He's also most detached. He has no material desires. So, jnana vairagya yoschayva shannam bhagavatingina. This is the definition of Bhagavan. That he has unlimited qualities which are divided into six main <coughs> categories. All opulence, all strength, all fame, all beauty, all knowledge and renunciation. This makes him all attractive. If someone is very opulent, very wealthy, by that quality alone, they become attractive to others. Just like we find there are some very rich people. Anyone who is very rich, they may not have any other qualities, but just by that quality alone, people want to know them. We all know the names of rich people, the name of Bill Gates. He's never been to Patiala, as far as I know. But you've all heard of him, because why? Well, everyone knows Microsoft. But it's not just for his technological contributions that he's famous. But that became, he became filthy rich by doing so. He's famous for that. Now he's trying to, he amassed so much money, he's trying to give it away now, and curing malaria. There are so many rich men, so many brothers fight, but when the Ambani brothers fought, it was in the newspapers every day. Because they're famous, because they're rich. So somehow or other, if one becomes wealthy, then it's interesting to us, it's, it's attractive to us. 
So Bhagavan means who's a lot richer than Bill Gates. In fact, everything that Bill Gates owned, and the Ambani's, and the Hindujas, and the Tatas, and the Bialas, and all the rest of them, actually it all belongs to Bhagavan. So he's the richest of all. And he's the most powerful of all. Manmohan Singh was fairly well known, but when he became Prime Minister, all of a sudden he became internationally well known, because all of a sudden he became more powerful. So when he got power, then all of a sudden it becomes attractive when he goes to a place, people photo, video, interviews. And then when someone's prime minister, they become powerful and then people are interested in them. And then afterwards, after they cease to be prime minister, the interest level goes down a lot. So you'll find some ex-prime ministers of India, hardly anyone even cares. Previously they are in the newspaper front page every day. And then afterwards you'll hardly find any interest in them. So the interest is... Not so much in the person, but because they're powerful. As long as they have power, there's some interest. But Bhagavan is all powerful. And again, as I remember Narasim Rao said when he came to power, he said, actually it's all by the grace of God. So that's true. That's true. It's by the grace of God that one has power, and ultimately it's his power. Previously, there were Rajas, and Narayan Chandaradipam. Among men, the representative of Bhagavan is the king, the Raja. They will exercise power on behalf of God, and they were able to do so as long as they realized that we're doing so as representatives of Bhagavan. When they forgot that, then they got thrown out. So if one is powerful, he is attractive. Then, Yashasa, somehow or other, if one becomes famous, then people are interested in him. Famous or even infamous. So, most famous is Bhagavan. Whether People say Bhagavan or God or Yahweh. Or not only on this planet, on other planets within the universe also. On other planets, Bill Gates may or may not be famous, probably not. But Bhagavan is well known. Either the Devas, they worship Bhagavan, or the Asuras, they don't worship Bhagavan, but still they know he's there. So he's the most famous. What to speak of in the Vaikuntha world, where everyone, they are there because they glorify Bhagavan, because they recognize him. And we are not there because we don't know what spiritualism is properly. So Yasha Sach, Shriyaha, the most beautiful, if anyone is beautiful, they become very popular. That's why in the modern age, this lecture is spiritualism in modern life. So in modern life, people are very interested in beauty. There are so many beauty parlors, and even there are beauty parlors for dogs. My dog should be very beautiful. And you can have mud put on your face so that when it comes off, your face looks better. And in, uh, in America, they have it's very common, they have nail polish salons where women go in and they put different designs on their nail, they look at it and say, no, I don't think so, and they take it off, put another one, and they spend half a day <laughs> having different nail polishes put on. It's one, nail, one way of making a living, if anyone's interested. You can introduce it in India. I'm not going to do it. So the idea is if that you if you have different designs on your toenails, 
then all of a sudden you become very beautiful. So people are very interested in beauty and as long as a young lady is beautiful, then they become, uh, they may become very famous and attractive. We find that there are so many beautiful young women who became film stars, but after some time, as their beauty fades away, their popularity fades away also. But anyway, beauty is considered a quality. The material body has limited beauty. But Bhagavan is all beautiful and he doesn't become old. In Christian religion there's a concept that God is the original person before the creation, so now he must be very old, which is true in one sense. He's old, but at the same time, it should be understood that he's not under the control of time, he's the controller of time. His body never deteriorates. His body is not made of mundane cells. He doesn't have to take vitamin E tablets. It's very popular in the West. People are very interested in vitamin E, which incidentally is... Um, there's much of it in Amla. Therefore, Chivan Prash is supposed to be a life prolonger. So that was already there in Indian culture before they did all this research and discovered this. But in the West, the people are very interested in eating antioxidants such as vitamin E, vitamin C, and doing yoga so they can live long. But anyway, they get old and die. But Bhagavan doesn't become old. He's always young and beautiful. In the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, in Rome, there's a painting by Michelangelo of God sitting on a cloud with lots of wrinkles on his face and a big beard. Uh, well, not that he's a Sikh, but the idea is there that he's very old and he has a long beard which is grey and he's looking very angry because he's so angry at everyone on earth. But this is a misconception. He's always beautiful. And he's not angry. So, Yashasya uh, Sriyaha Jnana, he's all knowledgeable. He knows everything. One who is knowledgeable becomes attractive. If uh, people are studying at this institute, so that they can get a universe, they can get their degree <coughs> that's considered very important, that one should have a degree, even if you don't use that degree later on. Many people, they get a degree in one thing and then they do something else completely different with their life. But it's considered just to show that you're sufficiently intelligent. present president of India is world famous not just for being the president of India but for his knowledge and intelligence. We find that uh, well one of the most famous knowledgeable persons in the modern age Stephen Hawking Physically, he doesn't look very attractive, but because of his knowledge, he's well respected. Of course, we have a difference of opinion with some of his theories, because his theory is that the whole universe came out of nothing. But we say, no, it came from Bhagavan. But nevertheless, he's a very intelligent and learned person, and he's famous for that. He's respected for that. And Vairagya, one who is detached from this material world, one who is not attached to anything, 
becomes respected for that. In India, there have been so many vairagis, and up to the present day, there are vairagis who are respected for that. So, anyone who has any of these qualities, wealth, power, uh, fame, beauty, knowledge, and renunciation, anyone who has any of these qualities becomes attractive to others. And Bhagawan means who has all these qualities in flow, all opulence, all strength, all fame, all beauty, all knowledge, all renunciation. Therefore, the name Krishna is the most suitable name for Bhagavan because Krishna means all attractive. It is not a sectarian name. So spiritual life, there may be various levels and various approaches. But ultimately spiritual life means to understand this very simple principle. Mamai Vamsha Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana that the, we are all spiritual beings. We are all part and parcel of Krishna who is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, spiritualism in modern life is intrinsically not different from spiritualism in any phase of human society. Either modern life or ancient life or future life. The Jiva or the Atma is part and parcel of Krishna. That doesn't change. The body changes. Society may change. Outlooks may change. Fashions may change. But that we are all eternally parts and parcels of Krishna, that does not change. However, there may be different approaches to understanding this according to the uh, social and cultural aspects of human society. Because although we are all intrinsically spiritual living beings, we don't die. We don't have any intrinsic relationship with anything around us. In other words, we're not ultimately, because we're not the body that we are presently in, that means we are not Indian or Punjabi or British or man or woman or physically healthy or physically weak. None of these things have anything to do with the soul. The soul is independent of all these things. But it is very difficult to understand this due to identification with the body. It's a very it's a very strong conditioning to think that I am this body. The whole society conditions us to think like that. And we feel like that. Just like if someone insults us, we feel, oh, we, we feel it in our heart. We feel hurt. We feel pain. We feel hunger. We feel thirst. There are various needs of the body, to eat, to sleep. So that we are not, ultimately that we are not the body, is difficult to understand, due to our identification with it. And particularly in the modern age, where the emphasis is very much on material development. In India at the present time, people are very upbeat, they're very hopeful that India is going to become a great superpower, it's a developing economy, and yeah, well, it's going on, no doubt, India's economy is 
developing, but that will at some point peak out. America's economy has been powerful, the most powerful, probably, economically, militarily, politically, America has been the most prominent country in the world for, since this Second World War, we can say about 60 years, but it won't last forever. There have been so many great powers, national powers. At one time, Egypt was a very powerful nation. Now, it's a non-entity in the world scene. Iraq, which is presently occupied by America, was the home of the Babylonian Empire, very powerful. Now it's an occupied country. Britain, just a short time ago, was such a powerful country, powerful nation. They used to say that the sun never sets on the British Empire. Our Guru Dave, when he first went to London, he said that in my childhood we always used to hear that the sun never sets on the British Empire. When I came to London, I found it's always cloudy. The sun never rises in England. <laughs> they felt they had to conquer the world because at least they might have some sunshine. It's always dull and raining. So it comes and goes. There are different powers in the world. So Indian people at the present time are very enthusiastic about the development of India to be a great national power, but these things come and go. International power. These things come and go. And when a nation becomes very powerful, then it actually becomes more dangerous for the citizens of that country, because then everyone hates them. And just, I was just in America, and uh, Everyone's feeling afraid. They're citizens of the most powerful nation in the world, but they're afraid that any time, any place, we may be subject to terrorist attacks. Just because we're... And if we go overseas, we're more vulnerable. Because just by being American, nowadays, especially, people... Uh, they, they're so unpopular. So when you become powerful, then... In the material world, people become more envious. So then, by becoming more powerful, more powerful means the power to subdue others, but then you also become the object of envy of others. So you actually become more fearful. So people in India at the present time are very much concerned with their material progress, but according to Shastra, and practically we can see that even now, this particular area of this earth planet, which is more or less, roughly we can say, from the Himalayas to Kanyakumari, this area is particularly important for spiritual development. According to Shastra, which is the authority on spiritual knowledge, this earth planet is the most important in the universe for spiritual development. Now, according to, to modern science, they doubt if there is life on other planets. Personally, as a child, I always doubted this theory that there is no life on other planets. Because I thought, well, if there is God, and there certainly should be, because otherwise, how, is every, how does everything exist in such great order? There must be someone putting it all together. It can't happen by chance. This is, they talk about religion being mythology, but modern science is big mythology. They say everything happened by chance, which is a 
very foolish idea. Look at this, watch this. This is some recording device. It's a little, you know, even though it's small and it's a relatively simple machine, it's quite complex, isn't it? It's a product of modern technology which came after years and years of research in various fields. We have this little device here. Here's something much more simple. Steel dhaba. If I told you it came into being by chance, would you believe it? There was an explosion. And then, after that, we saw there was someone who was throwing some fartaka, and then it landed in the garbage heap, and then all the garbage <coughs> exploded together, and this came. And it's just exactly correct, so that it fits on. It's not too loose. The cover's not too loose, and it's not too... It's not so tight, I can't get it off. It's not so loose that it falls off. And it's just the quality of steel, which is good. It doesn't rust very easily. And it's just thick enough so that it is strong enough to hold the water without being unnecessarily heavy. Came into being by chance. It's a joke, isn't it? So we're going to say the whole universe. If we say this came into being by chance, this is maybe a few thousand times more complex than this. And then what to speak of a single cell within our body that's thousands of times more complex than this. And then what to speak of the whole body, which is a conglomer conglomeration of cells all interacting perfectly. And we're going to say the whole universe came into being by chance. This is modern scientific mythology. We're not against science, but science, there should be some... Apart from being brilliant in understanding the details and in researching them all, they should have a little common sense also. Just to realize that some of their theories, even though propagated by highly, in some ways, highly intelligent people, even a child can understand it's foolishness. The whole universe has come into being by... It's all going on by chance. Well, even a child can, can understand that nothing complex can come into being by chance. Rather, science itself teaches us that any system, if not ordered, tends towards chaos. You see that. If it, this auditorium, if it's, not, if it's not regularly maintained, cleaned, painted, that everything, eventually the light bulbs go fuck, and you have to put a new one in. Of course, maybe 50 years ago they discovered light bulbs, they don't go fuck. And they wonder why they don't make light bulbs that last forever, because then the light bulb maker wouldn't have a business, would he? So they bought the patent years ago, so that you have to buy light bulbs that go fuck, and then you have to buy another one. Otherwise, you could just buy one, and then the light bulb manufacturer would be out of business. So, anyway, everything needs maintenance. If not, everything would gradually break down. So, anyway, um, there is God, and He made the universe. And He didn't make all the planets just so that lovers can stare at the sky at night and say, Look how beautiful are the stars. There's more reason. On every planet there are different living beings. This is described in Shastra. Now we can send our uh, spacecraft and look through our Hubble bubble telescopes and make different theories about the universe, but we may not have the ability to see what's going on. Even though we see, we may not have the ability to... Uh, our vision is limited. There are certain parameters limiting our vision. But according to Shastra, there is life on every planet. And there are heavenly planets. That means if we perform pious activities, Punya Karma, here then we can go to Swarga. 
and if not, then we're headed in the other direction. So there are various planets within the universe where people are, or the inhabitants are suffering and enjoying. In the heavenly planets, the Swarga Mandal, there's so much material enjoyment that people are not much inclined towards spiritual life. And in the hellish planets, people are suffering so much that they can't even begin to think of spiritual life. On this earth, people, they neither have the ability to enjoy very much compared to the Swarga Lok, nor are they suffering very much. So there's an equilibrium which makes it possible for them, or it's more suitable for them, to inquire into the real purpose of life, in, to inquire into spiritual life. And particularly in this Bharat Khan, this area, this is particularly suitable for understanding the principles of spiritual knowledge. That is why uh, we find the atmosphere here is still, even today, even today in the atmosphere of uh, India is highly materialistic. People are very interested in uh, material progress. More so than in the Western countries, I find. There they are, you can say, well, they already have material progress. And, but here people are more enthusiastic. That's maybe one reason why we find so many Indians in the West, because they're, in many ways, they're better workers than the Westerners, because the Westerners, they think, well, you, you do some job, you get some money, and you live. But Indians are more ambitious, so they do well. Companies like to employ them, because they like to work hard. So, in many ways, Indians are very materialistic, but still that atmosphere is there of spiritual life. That is the uh, natural characteristic of this area of the universe, particularly this, this area of the planet, that it is more favorable for spiritual advancement. There are many facilities here within Bharata-Varsha. There are many holy rivers which just by touching one becomes purified. Just by remembering the names Gange Cha, Yamuna, Chaiva, Godavari, Saraswati, just by remembering the names of these rivers one becomes pious. There are many tirtas or holy places. There are holy places because either Bhagawan in one of his avatars or some great saintly person went there. So these places, uh, be, just by seeing them or touching them or bathing in them or remembering them or stating their names, one becomes pious. And uh, particularly because Bhagavad Gita and the Vedic knowledge has been spoken here. This land is considered very suitable for elevation to Krishna consciousness or the ultimate goal of spiritual life. Of course, there are various uh, levels of spiritual knowledge. Not everyone recognizes Krishna as supreme, so they may be on a different level, but ultimately, ultimate level of spiritual knowledge means to accept as Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita that I, Krishna, am the goal of spiritual life. So spiritualism in modern life how should we adjust this for modern life? Because in the modern age people don't have time or even so much inclination for elaborate spiritual performances. 
Previously, everyone in India used to rise early and engage in spiritual activities, but now everyone stays up late watching DVDs, watching TV, and rises late. The atmosphere has changed somewhat. There's a lot of pressure for material success or even for material survival. One has to work long hours. So the spirit, it's not so easy, the, the time and the atmosphere. One doesn't have the same amount of time that one had previously. Nor do people have inclination for so many difficult spiritual practices. So in the modern age, the recommended process for God-realization is very simple and can be practiced even by persons with limited time. That process, as given in Shastra, is Haryanama, 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 Eva Kevala, Kalo Nasjeva, 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 Gatiranyata. That in this Kali Yuga, which is an age of quarrel and hypocrisy, there's a lot of hypocrisy, even in the name of spiritual life. There are so many people purporting to be spiritual leaders who actually, if we're to speak frankly, they're just cheaters, that's all. So in this age of quarrel and hypocrisy, the only way, the only way, the only way for genuine spiritual advancement is Harinam. There is no other way. There is no other way. There is no other way. So this genuine process of spiritual development rests on chanting the holy name of Hari, which means Krishna, Govinda, Narayana, Murari, these are all names of Krishna. Especially recommended is chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Along with this, one should understand what is actual spiritual life. As I was saying, there are many cheaters. They, rec they teach that, well, you do yoga for 15 minutes in the morning, then you, you become free from stress, and then you can enjoy life better. So they're practically they're materialists. Actual spiritual life means to understand everything here is temporary. My real existence is in the spiritual world. We don't belong here at all. So one should study the genuine shastras, given by Bhagavan, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, these are the most important. And one should follow some principles. It's not that you can just do what you like and think what you like and say what you like and be spiritual. There are some basic principles for purification of existence. So these basic principles are no meat-eating, no gambling, no intoxication and no illicit sex, which is very popular in India at the present time. But uh, sex, which is a very powerful force, that should be for bringing forth good children within the religious rite of marriage. So that's a, sex is a very powerful medium for uh, nurturing society by bringing forth good children. But if it's simply indulged in for animalistic pleasure, then it destroys the whole character of human society. And those who are educators, they can see that. As, as much as the young boys and girls mix up and frolic with each other as is normal on Indian campuses nowadays, then, then the more they become involved in that, then the the, the, the less they're able to concentrate on studies and they become, uh, they don't care for their teachers and they become totally frivolous and whimsical and misbehaved and everything else. So, 
illicit sex, which is being promoted in modern Indian society, even more than in the Western countries, is it actually destabilizes society ultimately. So these principles, these four principles are required to develop within human beings and within human society the basic godly qualities of mercy, cleanliness, austerity, and truthfulness. So obviously these are very big topics which can't be fully elaborated within one short lecture. We have, <coughs> we have many books which describe these topics in more detail. <coughs> so if you like, you can take some books which are published by our society. These books are not, uh, you know, how to become spiritual in five minutes. They're not anything purporting anything. They don't purport any quick fixes. It's the books of substance. They are called to, these books are a call to uh, lead a life of substantial spiritual progress. Not, not that spiritual life is like taking a pill or something. You just do it quickly and you get some instant effect. One has to be serious. One has to apply oneself. Just like in the college, if you're going to study, be successful in studies, you can't just take a, a notebook and finish it all up. If you're actually going to become successful, you have to apply yourself. It takes time, it takes application, it takes seriousness. So similarly in spiritual life, beware of these cheaters who offer you just, they offer you, they smile at you and take 5,000 rupees and give you some mantra and touch you and they say, now you are God. So, beware of such people. The real thing is not so cheap, but it's worth, if we actually realize what it means to be situated in spiritual life, then it's worth all the effort of taking it up. So, Hare Krishna, thank you for listening nicely. Uh, one thing I was just talking about the day before yesterday when I was invited to speak in an auditorium. Uh, this is a suitable arrangement, we can say it's a suitable logistic arrangement by which the listeners can hear the speaker, but according to Shastra, you can't learn anything of any value if you speak, if you sit above the speaker. <laughs> Spiritual knowledge or actual knowledge comes down. There's a certain mariada, so it's this typifies the modern educational ethos that we don't really care for the speaker and we think we're probably better than him. But he might have something interesting to say. So anyway, we'll sit and listen. But actual knowledge, receiving knowledge begins with submission and humility. And one, if one is actually to receive spiritual knowledge, it begins tadviti pranipatena, not just sitting below, but bowing down. So I'm not saying this because I'm telling you now you should all bow down to me, but I'm just telling you what is the uh, actual <coughs> principle of receiving knowledge. Hare Krishna. I'll finish there as there's limited time. And if there are any questions, you can please ask and I'll try according to what knowledge I've received from Guru and Shastra. I'll attempt to reply to that. Anybody can raise their hand if they want to ask any question. I can't see because I'm blinded by this light shining in my face. I can't see if anyone's raising their hand or not. That's also why I'm looking away. I'm not looking at you, is it? In these books on these books they have about public speaking, you're supposed to look at this, but I can't see you, so if I try to look at you, I just get blinded. So now my vision's gradually coming back. There's a hand up over there. Namaste. 
हरे कृष्ण religion that's actually it's not only in Sikh religion but that's it should be emphasized everywhere but unfortunately the culture is broken down otherwise previously people would never think to sit above the Shastra Thank you. how can we sorry I could coordinate spiritual education well it's unfortunate that at the present time education has become wholly and solely focused on uh, material progress but actually real education it's not so much concerned with how much you can learn and get inside your head but it's concerned with character development because if one has learned many things but has no good character, then what is the use? And if one has learned good character, but even you don't know so much information, that is the perfection of human life. So uh, you, can, you can please ask this question to your mentors. That we want, I, I mean, I see in India, especially, I don't see it in the West, but that I see that the young people, they actually want some, most of them, even though all the propaganda from the TV and everything is just to be a complete rascal, actually. That's the propaganda. But they want something spiritual. So I would request that the, and that the, practically everybody does, but the whole, somehow or other, the whole force of modern society is against that. Although as individuals, people want that. So I would request that the, uh, you can ask the administration of this college if they can implement that. It might be difficult because, because of a misunderstanding of what it means to be a secular state. They think there should be no religious education. But in the Western countries, their understanding is that there should be religious education, but it, it shouldn't be their understanding of secularism is that it shouldn't be limited to one path. That's why in uh, England, for instance, they, the schools, they regularly come to our temples. They, they, they bring groups because they have the idea that even though this is a minority religion in their outlook in, in Britain, still everyone should learn about it. So it's not that there should be no religious education, but rather there should be uh, widespread religious education so then the people can understand what are the various paths and then you can make a choice but if there's no religious education then it just what is the use of education at all if you understand how to be a doctor or an engineer and this and that but you don't understand what is the ultimate purpose of life so how to coordinate the two well you can ask the local I'm just visiting here I think this is only my third time in Punjab. But there are devotees here based in Chandigarh and Rajpura. You could ask if they could 
we are prepared to conduct some regular programs and seminars and this kind of thing. Would you like to organize this? So you could, please, for that, you could maybe contact Akinchan Priya Prabhu, who's sitting here, who's based in Chandigarh. And uh, I'm just a theoretician here. They do the practical work. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Yeah, please. I like to answer. I don't know whether I will be correct Well, it should be according to Bhagavad Gita. Then it's correct. If not, then it's not correct. I will try to say it. As for Bhagavad Gita, soul never dies. This is true. And he said that how can a soul and modern series can combine together? Just one thought came to me. spiritual, that's a fact. We, even if we deny it, even if someone says, I don't believe in the soul, the energy to do, to say that comes from the soul, ultimately. So spiritual life means to get in harmony with our true inner nature. But for that, we also require some, there's some basic sadhana requires to be accepted. Krishna. Uh, so I have a different opinion, maybe with uh first August Shirley and maybe correct as well. See, ultimately if Indian or we people are going for materialistic ideas, we are going for materialistic development, who is putting these ideas in our way? Ultimately, I feel somewhere there is a power, the supreme power of this equal God, and he or she is responsible for putting these ideas in our, in our mind, in the mindset of the people. I mean, if, if we think that he is such powerful, then he can, in a fraction of second, can change our mind. Okay, no, you don't do this, you have to do that, you have to do that. He can always guide us within a fraction of seconds. So, in my opinion, what's over here is here. Even if I'm sitting here, I'm doing the other job, teaching, or the other job, which I've been assigned to me, they are also motivated by that stream power. Um, well, this is discussed in Bhagavad Gita, actually, what you're saying. Motivation is discussed in Bhagavad Gita. Yes, God is all-powerful, but He gives a certain level of independence to everyone. Purusha prakriti stohi punkte prakriti jan guna karanam guna sangasya sada sadhyoni janmasu This is one verse which is the key verse to understand the last six chapters of Bhagavad Gita. That the jiva, or spiritual living being, is within material nature, which is a foreign atmosphere to us, actually. And we are attempting to enjoy the varied situations that we are born into. And we receive various situations which may be considered good or worse according to the guna, the sattva, whichever guna, sattva gun, rajagun, tamagun. So this, this is discussed in some detail that Bhagavan, he is upadrashta, he is the witness of everything, and anumanta, and he 
uh, allows us to do certain things, but he doesn't totally control our intelligence. We have some freedom of will also, which may, we may use or misuse. If, if we were just, our consciousness was completely taken over by Bhagavan, then we wouldn't be spiritual living beings. We would just be like robots. If we had no personal motivation, then there would be no question of love of God, because love means it's a voluntary approach to Him. So we do have a limited independence, and we can use that or misuse that. So He's in our heart, and yes, He does inspire us, but according to our desires. We can use it or misuse it. Otherwise, someone could go in the court, they say, well, why, why did you murder all these people? You say, well, God inspired me, so you have to let me off. Won't go in court. We are responsible. As, as human beings, we have more intelligence than in the animal species. So with that intelligence comes responsibility also. I have to finish here because um, we have another program in Rajpura coming up. Otherwise, I think we could sit here for a long time. 